May I speak to you in the name and the love of the one God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, so, I think I should say one thing before I begin is if I sound a little uh, congested, it's because it's I am, and um, I got a, eh, not a bad, but a kind of uncomfortable head cold much earlier in the week, uh, and, and what I'm dealing with is, is the residual uh, congestion. So I'm all better now, and I also got a COVID test yesterday, and it was negative. Um, so uh, I, I thought, you know, I should mention that, because you might reasonably be worried that I'm, you know, being irresponsible here. After all, we're, we're you know, a little short-staffed, so uh, you never know. But, um, but yeah, yeah we're, we're okay. Um, so, uh, I don't know about you, but, but it's beginning to look and, and feel a little like Christmas. Um, there is some snow on the ground. It feels like maybe a little less with each service this morning. Um, and for all I know, this is totally normal for Cleveland this time of year, but to me it seems kind of special. Uh, we also have Christmas music. Um, it's a cliche to say this, I think, at this point, but it seems to start a little earlier each year. Uh, it's inching further and further back, kind of closer to Halloween. Um, and, of course, we have holiday shopping well underway. Um, of course, we've been holiday shopping since shortly after the pandemic began. Uh, so it's almost two years of a holiday shopping season, it seems. Um, but, of course, another sign that Christmas is on the way is that uh, today is the first day of Advent, the beginning of a new liturgical year and, of course, the season that leads us to to Christmas. And um, personally, I've been, I've been looking forward to Advent for some time. I love the spirit of this season, this time of waiting, of preparing uh, for the inbreaking of, of the kingdom of God uh, in our lives. You know, the inbreaking of something new, uh, something, something holy. Advent, to me, always comes as a welcome opportunity and an invitation to, uh, to kind of reset, to, to take stock, to, uh, to turn the page. But the problem is that uh, this morning's gospel seems to clash with all of that a little bit, right? Um, here we are at the beginning of, of a new year in the church and uh, uh, the beginning of a season that leads to the most wonderful time of the year. But Jesus does not seem to be talking about a wonderful new beginning. Uh, he seems to be talking about the end of the world in kind of dreary terms. Um, his language is opaque, it's apocalyptic, and it is uh, hard to make sense of. It may be impossible to make sense of what he's talking about uh, apart from its Jewish apocalyptic context. Uh, outside of that context, this passage can sound uh, awkward uh, and even absurd. I mean, if, if Jesus were to return on a cloud, uh, like he says in this passage, uh, you know, where, where would that be? Uh, would that be in Cleveland? Um, would that be in New York? Uh, Jerusalem? Salt Lake City? You know, who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually think the LDS folks think he's coming back to Missouri first, but yeah, thought that would be a little obscure. Um, now, even worse than that, uh, Jesus says here that this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Um, and if he's talking about the end of the world, well, w was he wrong about all this? Well, what a way to kick off Advent. Uh, let's try to understand um, what Jesus is talking about here. So this whole passage that we heard uh, is, is all a quotation from Jesus. In other words, we didn't hear any narrative uh, this morning. And it is taken from an even longer discourse uh, of Jesus's that begins uh, as a response on his part to uh, some people around him, perhaps his disciples, who were admiring the splendor of the Jerusalem temple. And he says, well, actually, that temple is going to be destroyed, and then launches into this lengthy monologue uh, that we hear a, a portion of today. The New Testament scholar N.T. Wright has made the case that, that Jesus is therefore not a failed prophet predicting the end of the world because uh, in predicting that all these things will take place before this generation passes away, he seems to be talking about the destruction 
of, of the Jerusalem Temple and more generally the Jewish-Roman War that, uh, that led up to that event. Um, you know, and in terms of his language that seems to be talking about you know, the end of, of the world, well, this was a cataclysmic event for, uh, for the Jewish people who, who lived and indeed suffered through, uh, through it. Uh, it was indeed the end of the world as they knew it, and they did not feel fine. Um, in, <laughs> insofar as these events um, could be understood as a, a vindication of the Jesus movement, because remember, Jesus faced a lot of opposition from w within his own uh, uh, tradition. Um, so uh, insofar as uh, the, the folks who sort of, sort of provoked the Romans to... Um, to uh, uh, attack Jerusalem and destroy their temple. Uh, those folks did not follow the way of Jesus. You know, as we hear in the Eucharistic prayer and throughout our liturgy throughout the year, Jesus calls us to nonviolence and love and forgiveness and so on, um, and not to, you know, take up arms. Um, uh, you know, these events, therefore, could be sort of seen as a vindication of the Jesus movement and Jesus' claims uh, uh, to divine authority and, and messiahship and so on. Um, uh, in accordance with the apocalyptic genre which Jesus is, is drawing on, uh, uh, insofar as it's a, it's a vindication of him and his movement, it uh, could also be said to be uh, the coming of the Son of Man or even the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in some way. Um, now, of course, Jesus did not physically reappear. Uh, he did not come back uh, when the temple was destroyed or really, of course, you know, at any point in time uh, between um, 33 AD or so and, and today. Um, actually, it's more like 29 or 30, because Jesus is actually born before Christ, right? Like 4 or 6 BC. Anyway, um, so, uh, and, and Luke is writing to an audience uh, that, that uh, was living, you know, after these events had taken place. So, so Luke also emphasizes the cosmic, the general, and indeed the universal sense of Jesus' words here. Uh, it starts clearly with the temple in Jerusalem. We don't really hear that part today. Um, but then it zooms out, and it becomes less time-bound, uh, perhaps. Luke meant, it seems, uh, for this text to be relevant to Christians living after these historical circumstances, because it seems that Luke's intention in writing uh, was, you know, among other things, to give instructions for the followers of Jesus or, or followers of of the way, uh, as Luke was fond of calling it. And uh, this sort of adapt, uh, adaptation of, of the original context of Jesus' life and message uh, really stands near the beginning of a very long tradition of Christians interpreting and reinterpreting, specifically in this case, what Jesus' return or the second coming uh, really is about. Uh, Christians have had to grapple with questions such as, you know, do we understand this as sort of a physical or non-physical event? Is it bodily or spiritual? Is it in time or is it outside of time, uh, etc.? So, Luke, uh, it seems, he intended to make Jesus' words relevant for Christians living after uh, the events he may have had in mind. Uh, but, of course, we can ask, well, are they relevant for us now? You know, it's one thing to... Uh, uh, adapt a message for people living some number of decades uh, after the original time, uh, but you know it's been about 2,000 years. Um, well, a way to get at that might be to ask another question. Is our moment in time, our historical situation, unique? It can feel like the world is ending. There is yet another COVID variant. There is deep political and deepening political division and social unrest, it seems, uh, you know, climate change, wars and rumors of wars, etc. cetera. Um, and I think there are certainly ways in which the challenges we're facing right now um, are, are unique and unprecedented. But in other ways, these things always happen. I mean, just, you know, we can think back to 9-11, uh, we can think back even further to the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, or, or to World War II, you know, and, and so on. Um, it seems that, you know, every generation has felt like at some point or another that, like, this is, this is it, you know. It's never been like this before, and, and the end might be coming. Uh, there's a song by the band Wilco called You Never Know that goes, every generation thinks it's the worst, thinks it's the end of the world. So if that's uh, the relevance 
what's the message? What, what might Jesus have for us uh, in, in these words of his today? Well, although this passage is commonly interpreted as Jesus talking about the end of the world, perhaps we might instead hear Jesus telling us that when it feels as though the world and your life have been turned upside down, or in fact, you know, very often our lives are indeed turned upside down, um, despite that, God is on the other side. Uh, in this passage, you know, Jesus says, when these things happen, uh, uh, you know, don't hunker down in a bunker somewhere, but stand up and raise your heads. You know, meet the moment with confidence in God. Uh, God will be there for us. God is always there for us. So perhaps Jesus is telling his disciples and, and us that no matter what happens in our lives and in our world, new life and new beginnings are always on the other side of all our endings, especially for those who wait for God, who, who prepare room in their hearts for Christ to be born, um, as, as the Advent season calls us to do. This passage then, perhaps unexpectedly, can be heard as, as a message of hope, so this Advent season, may we look for signs of new life. Jesus talked about uh, the fig tree and, and all other trees. You know, we can see when uh, new leaves are sprouting. Uh, we can see when new life is coming. Um, and no doubt we can observe uh, signs of new life in our own life, in our own times, especially when we're um, quiet enough uh, interiorly to, uh, to observe where, where God and God's spirit are moving. So may we keep watch and stay awake as, as Jesus counsels us to do. May we discover or deepen our trust that nothing, no amount of personal or collective trial and tribulations is stronger or more real than God's love for us. Amen.